video and audio recording are strictly prohibited. Thank you and enjoy the performance. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Bob Sherman. This young man here is Lowell Lieberman. And these younger folks around me, not these two are slightly <laughs> young, older than younger, but these are the wonderful young pianists who are here for the eighth New York International Piano Competition. And we're right in the middle, or almost at the end. Tomorrow will be the last day. There'll be forehand the competition for piano four hands. There will be master classes during the day and then of course the awards evening following at seven o'clock. So before, well first of all Lowell, make yourself comfortable as Thank I will you. in one second <laughs> after I introduce the two gentlemen who are making it all possible, the Messrs. Stecker and Horowitz. It's always wonderful to be at another New York International Piano Competition. It takes almost two years to prepare for each one. And when we go home on Friday night and we wake up on Saturday morning, we're already thinking of 2018. And that's the way it is. It takes an enormous amount of work, but it's worth every moment that we put into it. Just look. They've been marvelous. and. Uh, the music has been absolutely stupendous all week. I also want to welcome everybody. And I would like to say that uh, Robert Sherman, who has been with us since the very start in 2002, has been very, very supportive of the foundation, Stecker and Horowitz Foundation, and extremely supportive of young people. His mother was a great teacher, a great pianist, Nadja Reisenberg and he's very much aware of it, and he's just been so supportive of our foundation. And every year, every two years, we commission a very outstanding American composer to give our young people the opportunity of learning a new work, which is very rare. And we are so honored to have a composer of the stature of Lowell Lieberman, this year's composer. So, you get to write a piece that all these folks had to learn from scratch. Yes, I'm, and, I'm sorry, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so, what, what went through your mind as you began? Were you looking for something that was technically demanding? Were you looking for something that is interpretatively interesting? How much marking did you make in the score? Well, you know, I, I don't know that I approached writing this piece differently from any other piano piece I would write, knowing that it was a competition. Um, you know, for me, it's the music itself that's always the, the impetus and the inspiration, not necessarily the events surrounding it. So I just try and write, you know, the best piece I can. Um, my, my piano music has a way of almost always turning out rather difficult, so I didn't have to uh, really think about making it especially challenging or anything. But I, I was very interested in, in um, uh, writing a piece that, that would really show great musicality, uh, give the pianists an opportunity to show their musicality. Do you give them leeway interpretively? Or are you one of these composers that says everything is a metronome barking and exact in and out and diminuendo and... Well, it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, the thing is, I, I am a composer who's very specific in, in my markings. I mean, my, one of my ideals in that respect is Beethoven, who was incredibly specific. Uh, no matter how specific you are, there is still room for a certain flexibility and, and musical playing demands a certain kind of flexibility. 
but it's always a, um, a balance of the freedom and being true to the score, and that's where the, the, the true musicality of the performer shows, I think. Um, a lot of my piano music is always written with um, rubato in mind, that, that kind of pianistic flexibility, and I, I find that often a lot of uh, performers approaching a piece of new music feel they have to play it with a certain metronomic straitjacket, and they don't allow themselves the same kind of uh, flexibility that they would in, in something like, like Chopin or Beethoven or whatever, and that's something very necessary uh, for these pieces. One of the, I guess, most popular piano pieces is your Gargoyles. Right. And there have been, whatever, 15 recordings of it. I think so about you, 25 at this oh, point. Oh, well, I was looking actually. at last yeah. week's uh, <laughs> schedule. But uh, so you have 25 different versions of them. Yes. Uh, does that bother you that, that some people have strayed more off the path that you intended? You know, you can't let it bother you because um, you know, it's almost like, I, I, I think of my pieces as I think some parents might think of their children. You know, they grow up and they think, my God, did I give birth to that? <laughs> and then they, they go out into the world and they do what they want, and you don't have much control over it. Uh, I mean, I've heard fantastic performances of pieces, and I've heard truly terrible performances of pieces. In fact, there was... Uh, one premiere, I, I was sitting in the last row, one premiere that I got on my hands and knees and crawled out of the auditorium so that I wouldn't be there when they motioned for me to stand. I, I was so um, mortified. But um, uh, no, I, I uh, you know, you have to have a certain detachment. And um, I, I think I've been very lucky uh, with performers and performances. I certainly was spoiled very early on because I, I went to Juilliard and so I grew up, I grew as a composer having my uh, uh, pieces performed by fellow students who were, you know, people like Stephen Huff and, and you know, musicians of that caliber. I so. think his Gargoyles was the first recording I had. Yes, it, it was, I think, yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm generally happy. Now, you're a pianist yourself. I am. Does that enter your thinking? Do you, do you write differently for the piano than you would for the flute or whatever? Well, the, the, the piano is certainly a, a, a comfort zone for me. Um, I, everything I write begins at the piano. I sketch at the piano, and then later on, I'll, I'll sometimes work things out. If it's an orchestra piece, I'll work out the details mm -hmm. at the computer or mm -hmm. nowadays. Uh, but definitely, um, I'm, I'm a frustrated pianist. I would have loved <laughs> to have performed more in my career, but there just wasn't the time. I, I couldn't personally balance the amount of time you really have to put in to be a, a performing pianist mm -hmm. with the amount of time I needed to um, uh, compose. So generally my, my performing was limited to chamber music where I could have the music <laughs> in front of me and things like that. But uh, certainly the experience of performing I think is very important for a composer to remember even things like the tactile pleasure of, of playing an instrument mm -hmm. because I think that performs, you know, certain things are just fun to play. They, they just mm -hmm. feel good to play. And um, I, I think that does come into my mm -hmm. music. Now we're going to hear, actually literally, we're going to hear a performance of the commissioned work, which yes. are the uh, two impromptus. impromptus. Yes. These kids had to learn the piece, as far as I understand it, with no further instructions. They couldn't call you up and say, well, what do you mean by this? Or how do you feel about this third measure There here? was a question about a wrong note that was relayed by, oh. by one of the teachers. So you that write got wrong the, notes? Not you deliberately. <laughs> but coming back again to the beginning, what was in your mind to impromptus? The, the, the name has a certain connotation you think of Chopin? Of well, the, the name, like most of the names for my pieces, came after the piece was finished. Uh -huh. uh, for me, I, I mean, music 
is about music, it's about the notes, it's about the melodies, it's about the manipulation of the musical material. It's not about sunsets or, you know, pictures or this or that. It's more like, I, I, I sometimes describe uh, the role of a composer as working with emotions, abstract emotions, the way a, a painter would work with color, an abstract painter. So it's, uh, you know, the thing is people often ask me what I meant by a piece and what does the piece mean? And uh, the truth is if I could put it in words, I wouldn't have to write the music. You know, it's, it's, it's like poetry. It's something non-specific. Do you find um, it easier or more difficult when you do have words? Like your operas or the um, ballet, which is a storyline? Right. Well, the, uh, the, my two operas were, in a way, the most enjoyable thing I ever wrote because the, having the words, having the libretto, removes a great sense of anxiety of where you're going. When you're writing a purely instrumental piece of music, you have to conjure up basically something out of nothing. And, and one of the challenges of composing is that you're always trying to find a reason to write one note rather than another note. Uh -huh. and, and those reasons kind of build as the piece progresses. You know, a piece of music kind of forms its own logic. But trying to find what that logic is within a piece you know, it's very, it can be very much like stumbling in the woods in the dark until, you know, you, you get a ray of light. All right. We're going to hear your stumbles in the wood. Uh, <laughs> and um, Garissa Vandekas from Canada. These are the artists that you will hear, by the way, were chosen by, I'm not sure what, names in a bowl or something. It was a random choice. It was not a selection by Stecker and Horowitz or, or even you, I don't believe. So anyway, where is Caressa? There you are, right in the front row. So you're going to play the pieces for us now, yes? OK, we're going to go down and listen.
So, Carissa, tell us, from your vantage point, what did you, what went through your mind when the music arrived? Wow, that's a lot of notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorting through it all at first, as with any piece, was a bit difficult. I think me as well as along of, as well as the other contestants had a bit of rhythmic trouble maybe in the second impromptu with the three against five against 11 and fitting that all together. Um, but eventually, I guess, just getting it all to flow and sound like an impromptu and um, what Mr. Lieberman was saying about the flexibility that, that kind of helped because we didn't need to worry so much about fitting every note Correct me if I'm wrong, I hope. But <laughs> fitting every note exactly where it needs to be and just letting it flow. But you had to come to that decision yourself because you just heard what he said. Now you had to learn the piece without that knowledge. So you came to that. It's one of the fascinating things, actually, because when you play most of the standard repertoire, there's a tradition that's built in. You know how it's played. There are tremendous variations interpretively but you know basically the way it goes and the kind of phrasing and so forth. Here you had to figure it all out for yourself. Was that an exciting challenge or was that something you want to put behind you and try to forget about it? Uh, it was alarming at first, but I think it was a really, really great experience because um, I think in that way you really get to discover your own voice in a way and you get to see what you think works and how you can deliver the music in a way that makes sense. And it's great that we can hear Mr. Lieberman talk now and we can kind of compare how did we do. Uh -huh. And was it difficult or again exciting to play the piece for the composer with him sitting right under your nose, so to say? That was so scary. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he does look a little scary when you come down to it, but, uh, <laughs> but he's pretty a pretty nice guy, and he wrote a pretty wonderful piece, I think. Fantastic, Fantastic piece. All right. Um, do you have any thoughts about what you heard, the kind of performance? And well, did it fit the, I, I, the mold I, of I, what you were thinking of? Before that, I just wanted to comment about the, the playing for performers, uh, playing for composers, because um, once Garrick Olson uh, came to my house to play my eighth nocturne for me. And you know, Garrick Olson is a huge, he's a very intimidating guy, and a pianist I had admired since I was young, and I was quite nervous at meeting him and coming to my house, and he, he sat down at the piano to, to, to play my piece, and he said, I'm so nervous. <laughs> and I just thought that was hysterical, uh, because I was quite nervous. But I, having been a performer, I actually uh, premiered a, a piece of Ned Roram's in front of him. And mm -hmm. uh, so I know what that feels like <laughs> playing for a composer. And it, it is nerve wracking. Right. Yeah. All right. Now, this is an opportunity for the rest of you guys to ask whatever you will of Lowell Lieberman. Ask him why he wrote this, that, or the you, other. You can or, ask. I might not answer. Well, that's, that's a problem we'll uh, solve when we get there. Any of you? You have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity here. So uh, don't all speak at once. Otherwise, I have to choose somebody, and that's always difficult. <laughs> you look like you want to say something. Uh, do I? Yes. <laughs> Oh, you have the mic already. I See, I knew you grabbed it away before anybody. <laughs> ah, okay. First of all, what's your name? Where are you from? Tracy. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, if you don't have a question, give us a comment on what your reaction was to the piece when you were learning it. Okay. Well, I obviously, um, nobody knew what you were thinking when you wrote this. There weren't many you know, notes attached to the score. So the way I learned it was um, I listened to a lot of your other compositions. Mm -hmm. and, oh, that's um, clever. <laughs> I, I really like the part in the first impromptu with the trill and then the melody kind of floating above mm -hmm. the trill. And I was wondering if you had orchestrated that because it sounded a lot like your flute sonata um, with the accompaniment 
being the trill and the ostinato and the flute kind of playing the melody. I was wondering if that was like a deliberate orchestration on your part. No, not, not certainly not deliberate referencing the other piece, but you know, composers have their little stylistic idiosyncrasies and uh, so you, know, you, you, you get things that remind you of other pieces. But uh, in terms of orchestration, I mean, I mean, I do think of the piano very much as an orchestral instrument. I mean, it's just not one color, and these pieces are very much about color and uh, how you will have three or four different lines going on at the same time, and each of them needs their own color uh, to bring out, just to articulate what, what's important at the moment. Okay, well, thank you very much. Now, who else has a question or a comment or a thought or a feeling about the piece itself? I'll go. All right. Um, wait, 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 wait. Hi, great T-shirt. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So I? give us, okay. yeah, tell us your name, where you're from. Okay, my name's Xia Qi, but uh, people call me Dragon because my last name Long means dragon in Chinese. Oh. And it's a very unique last name. And nice Is that a good dragon or a bad dragon? <laughs> Both. Uh, yeah. Okay. But um, yeah, I was wondering, um, I really like, um, I mean, I learned pieces like uh, sort of different. I never, I never uh, re listened to recordings on, on, online before I even learned the pieces. So I want to have like my own kind of. Uh, interpretation of the piece and then um, one thing that didn't make sense to me was that um, I think two weeks ago we got an email saying that there was a wrong note at the um, last page mm -hmm. from going to a B natural or C C flat going there's to a, a B C flat. flat B flat yeah right I was wondering why was that wrong note oh that's just computer you know copying no, why, why didn't the why didn't the B natural make sense because that's not the note I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, there's a, a story that a singer went to see um, Jerome Kern because she was going to do one of his songs. And while she was waiting for him, she sat down at the piano and played through it. And when she looked up, he was standing there and he said, you know, there is a C sharp on my piano and I chose not to use it. And that's kind of it. Well, the actually, I, I, was... I, want, I want to get back to that because it's interesting. Because I remember when I was a, a student at Juilliard, a young student, it was very much the time when, when kind of it was accepted that the notes were sacred, but everything else was kind of up for grabs. The dynamics, the articulation, everything, and the, that performers would just take the notes and then do what they wanted with them. And um, it was actually Jacob Latiner, uh, who I studied piano with, who, who really was one of the first people to drill into me the, the equal importance of all the markings in a piece. Um, and I mean, what I've come to realize as a composer is that what comes first to a composer is really the whole dynamic emotional framework and you're then filling that in with notes. And it's almost in certain cases that you could change the notes easier than you could everything else. Okay. Um, and yes, a, a, a B flat or a B natural could have worked just as well. But I happen to choose the, the C flat, B flat. Okay. So. All right. Any other questions or thoughts? Well, let me ask. We got a, got a volunteer? Nick, you've got your own mic now. Okay. Wait, is this on? Okay. Um, I know what the politically correct answer is, but do you actually have a favorite piece of, that you've written? If so, what is it? Um, no, I don't. I don't. Um, you know, the, the, uh, I've written a lot of pieces. Um, I have a couple of least favorite pieces, but I'm not going to name those. Um, but you, you know, it, it, it's often the latest piece I wrote is my favorite because I'm more absorbed with that. Um, I, I, I forget my pieces. I mean, when you've 
written over a hundred pieces of, you know. You know, years ago, I uh, interviewed Aaron Copeland, and he said that it's lovely that everybody plays Billy the Kid and the fanfare and all that. He said, but what about the other pieces yeah. that nobody plays, yeah. my stepchildren? I really wish those would come. Do you have any? Any um, pieces that you love, but nobody else seems to agree with you? Um, I mean, those hundred well, pieces. Well, there, there, are certainly, there are certainly pieces that are performed less than others. Does that and, bother you? Um, listen, they have, something has to be performed. <laughs> I, I take a pretty blase attitude towards it all, uh -huh. I think. Uh, I'm happy for the pieces that are performed. Yes, I'd love everything to be performed, but uh, okay. happy for the ones that are performed. Let me ask a question <clears throat> for our two boss men here. Why do you, hard enough for all of these young kids to learn a brand new piece within a very comparatively short period of time, why do you make them memorize it? Why can't they just have the music at least to have that, uh, that not crutch, but at least to have that assistance. As performers ourselves, uh, having been on the concert stage for about 45 years, you don't know a piece until you memorize it. And you feel so much more at home when you're communicating with the music, looking into space, looking at the keyboard, looking at your associate who's at the other piano, and having to turn a page to the next one and to the next one is totally distracting. And I feel that uh, one doesn't know anything that one has to recite uh, and do on a daily basis or an evening basis that you can rely upon a score. It's just, would you go to the theater? Would, would you want to see uh, actors and actresses putting on Shakespeare, reading the score from the play and uh, just in front of the stage? There's no meaning to it. And uh, that's my personal feeling. What about chamber music? I mean, that's everybody different. has a score. That's different, because you cannot rely upon your memory when other people are involved. And uh, you're at risk if, God forbid, you have a memory slip, or if you skip a, a measure, or you skip a beat or so. It can throw everybody off. And I think it's required to use your music for that purpose. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Further questions for our composer in chief here? Ah, all the good stuff seems to come from this side. <laughs> Hi, go ahead. Except for you, our dragon man. Hi, um, I'm actually trying to get into composing this year because I go into college my, this fall and I want to uh, try doing some composing on the free side when I'm not doing piano. Like, how would you suggest I should go ahead and start? you know, this, you know, huge field of, like, study, like, what should a young composer be mindful of and, like, what I should, like, study and try to do? See, your competition is on the way. That, that, well, that's, that's a lot of questions rolled into one. Um, you should write, first of all. Just write, I mean, because that's what composers do. You learn by writing. Um, all of my composition teachers, it's funny, they've all said to me, composition cannot be taught. And, uh, you know, the truth is that, that once, you know, you know the basics of theory and orchestration and everything, the, these are all, you know, rather prosaic things that you can learn from books. Anybody can learn these things. But the actual writing of music is something very different, and especially uh, you know, I think it was easier in Mozart's time where, when there were certain ways one was supposed to write and there were accepted forms and a certain, you know, accepted harmonic language. <laughs> Nowadays, um, there's such a variety of, of styles and, and different techniques. Um, it's often very confusing uh, for young composers, how do they find their own style? What do they do? People are telling them this. And, and, you know, the thing I tell my students is don't ever let anyone tell you what kind of music you should write. You know, you write the music that you would want to hear. Um, and that, that's all I do. That's all I've ever done. I, uh, you know, I, I write the music that I would want to hear if I was sitting in an audience. Uh, but that would seem to pose an insurmountable 
problem for you as a teacher because a student comes to you with an electronic score with something that is not what you would like to hear. How do you, how do you work with such a such because a Because there, there, you okay. What I try and do as a teacher is I don't write their music for them. I don't show them how to write music, but I try to give them the tools to stand back and listen to their music as if it was written by somebody else. Uh -huh. So for me, it's all about building a sense of self-criticism, to have that detachment, to listen to your piece and not just be in love with it because you wrote it, actually to think about what you've written and, and make some very conscious decisions as that, is this what you want to be communicating? Because mm -hmm. one of the things I've always firmly believed is that uh, music, like all the arts, is a form of communication. And no matter how complex the idea is that you're communicating, it's the job of the artist to communicate that idea as clearly as possible. Obviously, if you're writing, and we're talking about a piano piece, you could play it, you know what it's like, you know what it, it does sound like. Right. When you're writing an orchestral work, or an opera even, do you make changes after you hear it, or can you really hear it in advance in your head? Not, not that often. I mean, sometimes, when, dealing with especially opera, um, you know, when you have an orchestra that's in a pit, all of a sudden you're, you're dealing with unexpected balance things just on base, uh, you know, based on the acoustics of the hall you're in. So um, uh, that's a case where you have to make uh, adjustments, uh, there are unexpected things. But generally, um, I, I tend not to write something down unless I know what it's going to sound like. Hmm. You know, so, and, and that's what the studying prepares you for, that's what the orchestration pr prepares you for. Sure, there are occasional surprises, mm -hmm. but it's not like, I mean, I don't, I don't see how somebody could write a piece of music not knowing what it's going to sound like when it's played. You know, who were some of the composers that I don't know. I don't want to say influence you, but who were some of the composers that you admired when you were a junior? Well, w when I was a student, I could easily rattle off the the composers who I felt um, um, influenced me, and they began with you know Bach and Beethoven, and went oh, those to, old guys went to Shostakovich <laughs> and Britten, who were still alive when I was a student, mm -hmm. um, very much alive. Uh, other composers, Foray, Alcan, uh, you know, all, all kinds of, of composers. What I find now is that even certain music that I don't necessarily like influences me. That everything I hear kind of gets thrown into the mm -hmm. frying pan and stirred up and some, some element of something might come out, you know, that, that uh, I don't even expect. Yeah. Oh, <coughs> All right, let's, yes? May I just make a comment? Uh, actually, having heard your compositions 22 times. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's amazing hearing the same work by 22 different <clears throat> people. I can look at, whether it's Aaron, or I can look at uh, Menjo, or Angie, or uh, Prudence, I can look at anyone here and tell you exactly how their performance differed mm -hmm. from the next person's. Mm -hmm. It's your piece. Mm -hmm. uh, I never heard it before. You submitted it to us, except Mel and I tried it um, before we even distributed it. And uh, Could you play it? If I practiced it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not an easy piece. Yeah. But uh, it's amazing that there, was so, there were really 22 different mm -hmm. interpretations mm -hmm. uh, that this piece that takes eight minutes has 22 different interpretations. Can you imagine what happens around the world, yeah. you know, if they get hold of it? But, which of course they will. Everybody's going to be playing this. Everybody wants to play Lowell Lieberman. <laughs> <laughs> but Mel just has one thing to say. Uh, actually, the competition has many aspects, <clears throat> many spokes to the wheel. And Today, more than ever, young pianists, young artists must be involved with contemporary music. And I think that's one of the reasons that we've commissioned a new work 
since, nine, since 2006. When we commission the work, we don't really tell the composer what we want, except we tell them we want a seven or eight minute work. And uh, having Lowell Lieberman as a composer is a great, great honor for us, but we do this for our contestants because you will never have the opportunity <clears throat> of basically doing a world premiere and having the composer here. And I think this stemmed back from when <clears throat> we were perhaps in our 20s, late upper 20s, and we were celebrating our 10th anniversary as a duo piano team. Early 30s. <laughs> <laughs> 28 to be exact. Truth and advertising <laughs> comes out here. And we decided rather than to give a concert in Carnegie Hall or Town Hall, why don't we see if we can have a work commission for Stecker and Horowitz? And we never ever thought that the commission would be accepted and Walter Piston did accept the uh, commission, a great, great composer. And uh, it was interesting, he asked us what we wanted. Mm -hmm. And um, we told them we you know, wanted to work about 20 minutes because our orchestras were looking for solos for about that period of time. And we wanted something to be equal. In other words, the first piano part to be as difficult as the second. Because at that time, there were teams that would ask for a more difficult first piano and a little easier second piano. <laughs> so we asked for that. And he also asked, what would you like? And we couldn't tell them what we would like. We just said we would like to have the last movement, a great movement, which would um, be very, very exciting. And we waited for how long? Three, four months. I believe. We only had to wait uh, four months for your piece, I think, right? <laughs> and during the four months, we were thinking, what do you think it's going to be like? No, I have to interrupt. We waited four months when he finally said he would start the third movement. <laughs> but he had been writing a concerto for Rostropovich for the Boston Symphony, and he said that has to take precedence because they have a world premiere that they mm -hmm. have to, they've announced already. And so we waited for that. But it probably took a year or so, a little more than a year, to finally get the work. But I would say for you, the young people that we deal with, probably one of the most exciting concerts ever, one of the two most exciting, was playing the world premiere at Dartmouth of the Piston Concerto, not knowing what the reaction would be. But it was such a great, great thrill for us and an accomplishment. It was just a, a grand, grand evening. But this is what we want to do for young people today, because it's very, very important to work on contemporary music as well as your romantic and Baroque and classical. So again, I say that uh, having somebody of the stature of Lowell Lieberman is most uh, gratifying and important to us, for you young people. Could you just expand on that a little bit more, sort of playing devil's advocate here? There's so much great music by Chopin and by Schumann and by every other composer you can think of. Uh, you can spend your life with Beethoven, as some or Bach, as some artists have done. Why is it important to play all types of music, including contemporary music? Well, I think it's important as a musician to be able to know all styles. I think it's important also when you're preparing a concert in a major city where they are looking for the artists to do contemporary music today. It wasn't that important when we started touring in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, we did do contemporary music. We did the Piston Concerto for us. We did a Stravinsky work for two solo pianos. Um, but today... Ludoslawski. Ludus, right. But today, if you want to have a successful career, <clears throat> you really must delve into the contemporary... I'm, as, I'm on the advocate of playing a complete contemporary uh, concept, but I think you have to have certain works that are of a high standard in the contemporary field today. And this fits the bill. Let me get back to you, Lowell, because I've raised a very intriguing point. Uh, how do you get audiences 
to want to hear contemporary music. It's so difficult for an audience to say, oh, gee, it's a piece I never heard of. I can't wait to hear it. That used to be the norm in the 19th century. But now, kind of, if it isn't Beethoven and Schubert and Mendelssohn and uh, composers they feel comfortable with, they're, they're a little scared. Mm -hmm. I mean, after, uh, how many, 125 years later, they, you see Schoenberg on the program, you run the other way. You just, it's sort of, it hasn't, it hasn't held. Modern theater, totally accepted. New films, obviously, all the time. What's wrong with music? Why doesn't it have the same? Well, first of all, I'm glad that I don't really have to worry about this problem that's a problem for administrators, for the people <laughs> who have to fill the halls. So I, I don't worry about that. Um, I can only speak personally. Well, of course. I have had no problems with audiences with my music. Um, you know, once they're there and they're seated and they're, they hear it, they seem to like it. Um, getting them, you know, the, this whole thing, I, I, I think classical musicians, uh, I think the classical world has almost talked itself into this doomsday scenario of shrinking audiences and nobody likes new music. And I think people were saying that in the 50s. I think they were saying it in the 1850s, you know. Um, yes, it's a different world from when Mozart and Haydn were writing the new music because all you basically heard was new music. But it was a totally different structure because they were writing for royalty for these small courts. And if you think how small that audience really was, I'd say we're probably in a very healthy state right now. I mean, I think there's probably a bigger audience now for classical music than, than there ever has been. When you said before that you want to write music that you enjoy, mm -hmm. that you would want to hear. Do you specifically write music that you think an audience will want to hear? No. Or is that their problem? Well, I, I, I think it's important for any artist to be aware that they are writing for an audience because it's a form of communication. But when I think of an audience listening to my piece, I think of a hall filled with 2,000 of me. <laughs> uh, I'm aware that someone has to listen to it, but I try and put my place, you know, I, I don't think, oh no, this is going to be a hard sell for an audience or I have to do this. I, I, I don't do that. I also don't think of, oh, what is the critic going to say? Um, I just, you know, after a certain point, you write what the music tells you to do. The, the music takes over. <laughs> Obviously, if there's a commission that you've mm -hmm. accepted, that's the piece you write yes. for whatever. Yeah. If somebody wants something for two bassoons and saxophone, that's what you're going to write. Uh, well, I wouldn't, but well, they could ask for it. <laughs> <laughs> but do you write it all something that nobody's asked for, but you particularly want to do I, anyway? I, I almost never, because I simply haven't had the time. Because um, well, that's a good uh, well, good development. Well, the thing is, I you know I. Almost from when I graduated Juilliard, I was working full time on commissions, which is a great luxury for a composer to be able to do that. But, Very few have but done. the flip side is then you have to write what people are willing to pay you to write. You can't write just whatever piece you want to write. Um, I happen to like um, certain restrictions because they, they then become creative challenges. So unless a piece is something, you know, totally ridiculous, like a, you know, contrabassoon <laughs> octet or, you know, whatever, um, I, I, I look on the, the, the particulars of a commission as, as uh, incentives to, to be more creative. Okay. Now let's get back to our young people here. I'm looking at this side because that's where most of the questions come from, but how about from here? or comments how you felt about the piece, or whether you think you're going to play it again, or want to play it again, or <laughs> anything else. Uh -huh, I see a hand over there. I want to know how you write your pieces down when you compose them. And for me, it would be very interesting um, if you say us something about our piece, how you wrote our piece. 
Well, I, I, like I said before, I always write at the piano, and I sketch um, at the piano in ink, not in pencil. I tend to scratch out rather than erase. Um, and uh, piano music, I will generally write entirely at the piano, and, and there will be a, a full score in manuscript. When I'm doing an orchestra piece, that'll be sometimes more sketchy, and then the details will be filled in at the computer nowadays so that there's actually no full manuscript of some of the bigger orchestra pieces or the opera scores or ballet scores. Um, I compose very much from A to Z. Th that is, I, I tend to compose in the order that the piece will be listened to in. I mean, sometimes I'll get an idea that I know is going to go at the end of a piece, but I'll just sketch it and then go back to uh, working on the piece from A to Z. Um, as, as far as the actual process of composing, that's a little more difficult to articulate, and it's different for different pieces, but, you know, you just get um, a piece of material that you know is a seed that the piece can grow out of. And I, I, I think of my pieces as being very organically created, that everything grows out of that initial idea. And whether that initial idea is a chord or a melody or a group of pitches or an accompanimental idea or something else, it, it can be different for different pieces. But I, I think very much of, of keeping a piece organically uh, unified and tight. Do you have a specific work schedule? Do you go from 8 to 12 and 1 no, to 5? No, I, I wish I had the discipline to do that. Um, and. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very much one of these composers. If I have a year to write a piece, I will think about it for 11 months. <laughs> and, and I mean, actively thinking and worrying and, and not liking anything I'm thinking of. <laughs> and then, you know, deadlines are a great inspiration. They're the best inspiration. <laughs> uh, if it wasn't for deadlines, I don't think I'd get anything finished ever. Well, that's an interesting point. <laughs> and of course, our pianist here had the deadline. How long did you have to work on the pieces? Somebody, yeah, why not? How long did you have to work on the a couple of months, wasn't it? For this composition? Um, eight weeks. Yeah, eight weeks. Eight weeks. Eight weeks. Yeah. I think I heard eight weeks. Is that right? Yeah, okay. We, we sent it out eight or nine weeks in advance. And um, we have the confidence, because the, their repertoire is quite vast, um, that if we give them the eight or nine weeks and we specify it has to be memorized, uh, there's very rarely a problem with it. And I think it, I would like to compliment compliment all of them here that it's a big feat to learn something like these two impromptus in eight weeks, be able to get up and perform it well. Um, we congratulate them for that. And uh, many people ask this, as you did before, why do you feel that you, they have to memorize it? As performers, as Norman said, we just feel that it has to go into the subconscious and come out. And we know, and it's much more difficult for two pianists to play contemporary music because we one is thinking you have two minds, but it's easier for one pianist. They can something happens, you can fix it. We can't we can't fix it that easily, but we do have the confidence that all of you are able. And uh, every competition, we are proven correct that you do have the ability to memorize it in eight weeks, and we will always do that. We may make it six weeks in the time. I don't know. <laughs> I just, I just want to make one comment that at the time we sent out the uh, Lowell Lieberman, we also sent the music for the uh, ensemble, the One Piano, Four Hands. And we specifically made mention of the fact that this does not have to be memorized. Mm -hmm. 
see. Because of, again, you have the That's two right. different artists, and they have to That's not right. only play together, but so think together. Tomorrow we're going to see what happens, because we paired them when they came to New York on Sunday. They have met their partner on Sunday, mm -hmm. and they're going to be playing together for judging on Friday. How different, from your vantage point, how different is one piano, four hands from two pianos? Well, uh, physically, one person pedals. We're at two pianos, you have your each set of pedals. Aside from that, uh, the keyboard is divided in half, <laughs> and you have a limited range on the keyboard. But many times, I might have to extend my hand over Melvin's, or he might have to extend his hand over mine, and uh, depending upon what the score uh, dictates. And uh, there are many, it's more difficult, one piano, four hands, f uh, physically. Mm. But as far as emotionally, there's much more, uh, I will say, you have much more of a sweep, a grand feeling. I mean, when we get up, whether we played uh, uh, the Schulz Evelis Strauss for a, uh, uh, there was nothing. I felt I was in Vienna playing, <laughs> you know, I had the whole keyboard to myself. And if mm -hmm. I was restricted with Melvin at the other side, I would be only one half of a dancer. Mm -hmm. That's it. But if we did do something one piano, four hands, uh, and it was originally written that way, like the Schubert F minor fantasy, we would play it on one piano, four hands. Mm -hmm. But we both felt much more freedom on the two pianos. What was the idea? I think the New York Piano Competition may be the only one that has this forehand requirement. What was the idea? You, you're choosing pianists who are going to be essentially solo pianists. What was the thinking behind it making this? It all comes down to money. You need two pianos everywhere you go to no, play two piano music. music for the competition. Well, oh, that's true. Yeah, you know. Uh, it's, then there's logistics. We couldn't get really two pianos no, very No, 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 that's not what I meant. What, what I meant is why did you want a forehand component to your competition when all the other competitions don't feel it's necessary? Well, we feel that being a collaborative pianist, playing with another pianist, is very, very important. And rather than have, we're not having an orchestra, we have an accompanist for the, second, for the concertos, but we felt this brings two young people, two different minds, and we like to see how they work during the week together. And I would say that tomorrow, when we're, we will both be upstairs listening, that it's quite amazing when we hear 11 teams, what they've accomplished from Monday to Friday. <laughs> they are really outstanding, they'll be outstanding performances. It's, it's like chamber music for us. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the chamber music experience, except that you're not having strings, you're not having uh, any other instrumentation, and they're playing together in an ensemble that is really uh, very, very challenging. Well, let's turn back to Lowell Lieberman. You have a two-piano concerto, right? Not a two-piano concerto. I have, I have a couple of two-piano pieces, and actually... But they're not concerto. Right? No, no, and there's a sonata, and there's variations on a theme of Mozart, and there's a piece called Daydream and Nightmare. Uh, well, the Daydream and Nightmare is actually for two pianos, eight hands. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, but no, no two-piano concerto yet. But at least when you're writing that way, do you keep in mind what these guys just said, that you have to have an independent... Uh, freedom and yet I've uh, I've not written anything for piano duet yet uh -huh. but yeah the 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 of course the two piano eight hands deals with that that you've got two people at each piano um, you know it, it's <laughs> you know people mentioned there were a lot of notes in this piece when you <laughs> write two piano music that's a lot of notes uh, for a composer um, I remember Henry Cowell said that you had these tone clusters, which are, you know, right, a top note and a bottom note and a big black line between them. And he said when he went to Russia, he found out that the music was paid by the note. Ah. So <laughs> the good part was he had stacks of rubles. The bad part was he had stacks of rubles, which couldn't take out of the country to do anything with. Yeah. But uh, so you've read a lot of notes <laughs> just for free. So come on, who else has questions or thoughts? This seems to be the good side of the room. Am I missing? Aha! 
we have a representative from our side here. So, what's your um, name? Where are you from? I'm Sophie from Austria. Austria. Wow. Oh. And I was interested if you ever weren't able to finish a piece for a deadline. No, no. I mean the, um, you know, a cup. Most people who commission pieces expect you to be like months late. They kind of build <laughs> that in. Um, there have been a few cases where pieces have been a week. Actually, I called you guys up and asked if I could have another two weeks, and you said, "Sure, it's fine. They're because not going to be told sent you to down." Start early. We didn't yeah, <laughs> but I uh, I was dealing with uh, a full length ballet where. The, I, I was dependent on waiting for the scenario for the ballet, which I didn't get until a year later mm. than I was supposed to, and so that kind of knocked my whole uh, schedule off balance. So I think this, this, no, but, this piece was two weeks after the, I think, the original deadline, right, but I think. I believe you did meet the deadline. No, I think it was two weeks after. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Close enough. But, but I called to ask if it was OK, and you said, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Before I go back to the other side, any other thoughts from, from here or questions? Anybody? All right, your last chance here. All right, this is my good side here. <laughs> Who has some thoughts? You look like you have a thought. <laughs> What's your name? Where are you from? Oh, me? Yeah. Uh, Ryan, and I'm from North Carolina. All right. And beyond that, uh, <laughs> do you, did you learn this with a southern accent? Uh, how, did it, how did it work for you? <laughs> I don't have a southern accent, but... Um, <laughs> Why not? <laughs> well, I, I wasn't born in North Carolina. I was mainly raised in, up north in Chicago. So. Uh -huh. I see. But I uh, um, don't really have any questions, I guess. Well, what did you feel about learning a brand new piece in uh, limited time and knowing also that you had to memorize it? Was it, was it an exciting challenge or was it a difficult and, and awkward one? I think it was really pressuring for me because actually in, in my case, I had been put like as in alternate for the competition, so I didn't hear back, and, and I had like five weeks to, instead of like everyone got like, I think oh, eight to 10 weeks. a real rush job. So I was really frantic about meeting the deadline for like memor actually memorizing it, but um, I ended up like doing it and it was fine. Did you memorize it separately or just by working on the piece, you got to know it? Um, yeah, the thing about it is, um, Especially with uh, this kind of modern piece was like a bunch of notes. I had to first rely on like muscle memory first to like really get in the groove of uh, memorizing it. And then after I got it in my fingers, then I was able to really make the piece my own and put my own, you know, really artistic uh, personality into it. Okay. So. Very good. Very good. Lowell, what are you working on now? What's, what's next on the agenda for you? I'm working on nothing right now. Really? <laughs> I'm taking a break. Oh. Yeah. Uh, no, because the, the last year of uh, composing was, was very intense. I basically had to write um, something like three hours of music in, in a year. You're talking about the, new, the uh, ballet? Well, the ballet and the symphony and this piece. So it was, it was really a very, um, it, it was the first year in my life, I think, that I was actually um, composing every day uh, because I knew I basically had to get um, a minute of music written almost every day in order to, to meet uh, the deadline. So it was tremendous, tremendous pressure. And so uh, after that, I just needed some time uh, away well, I can from, understand. from writing. So I'm doing house renovations right now, <laughs> and gardening. But this is, and it's an interesting point. You said you might get a minute a day. Mm -hmm. This suggests that you work on that one minute until it gets just the way you want it, as opposed 
to working on a section of a piece in, uh, without completing any one set of measures. Well, well, not necessarily. I mean, it, it can work both ways. But, you know, um, I think for most composers, um, a minute of music in one day is a lot of music to write. It's because it takes a long time to write, uh, and especially if you're talking fast music. You know, a minute's worth of fast music is a lot of notes. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really a, a kind of a lot of, a lot of music, and, and when you have that pressure of just having to do it day after day after day, it's, it gets very... Do you ever have very, the equivalent of writer's block? I mean, you ever look at this blank page and you say, oh, what am I going to do now? It's not so much writer's block as being super critical and not liking what's coming out. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, again, deadlines have a way of, of curing that. <laughs> you know, you, you just have to get it down. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I find this with my young students. A lot of my, my students want to talk about the process and how do you deal with writer's block. And I tell them, just put notes down. Because if you don't put the notes down, you don't have anything to work with. But if you put any notes down, then you can look at them and say, okay, what's wrong with this? and then you can fix it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the thing is, you know, waiting around for that brilliant idea to come is not really how it works. You, you have to put something down and start chiseling at it and molding it. Um, and uh, actually, it was very valuable, uh, a thing that David Diamond made me do, um, which was to, to look at uh, Beethoven's sketchbooks and read this book that analyzed Beethoven's sketchbooks. Because Beethoven would, would write an idea, and usually it would be the most banal, uninteresting idea, and then he would analyze it and say, what's wrong with this idea? Well, the rhythm is too regular. So he'd make 10 more sketches where he'd try um, changing the rhythm. And then he'd get to a certain point and he'd say, okay, now what's wrong with it? It hits the pitch E flat too many times. So he'd make five more sketches where he'd change the melodic outline. And so he'd go through these different very, and you can see in the sketches, very clear um, thinking thought process. So you'd start out with this one maybe not very interesting idea and by the time you had 20, 30 sketches at the end, you'd recognize something from one of the Razumovsky quartets or one of the symphonies yeah. or something. So um, it, it, it's really that sense of working with the material that is technique for a composer. Mm. Um, you know, and really, um, I, I, I think what a lot of young composers feel is that somehow the idea has to come out un unadulterated and pure, and if it isn't that thing from the onset, somehow it's not valid. And the truth is, you have to get down and dirty with the material and tear it apart and transpose it and mm. add notes and take away notes and stitch things together. I think we've all seen these movies of, of composers who are just get this inspiration. They sit down and the whole piece yeah. pours out yeah. of them in, in, a, in a flash. So. Uh, yeah. We assume that's how you do it. You yeah, know? I mean, it wasn't even true of Mozart. I mean, that's <laughs> that's the cliche about Mozart. But he sketched. We just don't have his sketches. You know, they 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 didn't survive the way Beethoven's did. I've never understood how these early composers who did not have uh, computers, did not have any any of the current tools, how they could just physically write that many notes, that many fill that many pages with of. of I, well, I let, let me imagine. tell you, it, it is exhausting because my first opera, uh, The Picture of Dorian Gray, um, I wrote by hand with pen and ink. The, the orchestral score is about 800 pages of large orchestral score, a uh, big orchestra. And I'm left-handed, so it's very difficult <laughs> to write with ink because, you know, you... <laughs> um, and when I finished writing that score, I, I felt like I was going to die. I mean, <laughs> it was exhausting, and you get hand cramps. The, yeah. These 
Uh, computer programs have been such a blessing for me. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, it used to be you'd write an orchestral score and you would have to leave three to six months built in to have the score and the parts copied. Mm -hmm. You would have to factor that into to every commission. And now, you know, I orchestrate directly into the computer. And when that's done, there's just a little bit of editing that's needed and I can print out a set of parts in a day mm -hmm. or two. Yeah. So it's really, that has speeded up the, the composition progress, right. uh, process tremendously. Okay. All right, we're going to hear your impromptus once again. And this time the pianist is Brian Le. And Brian, where are you? So, where's the mic? So what was your reaction when you first got the music and you knew you had eight weeks to learn and memorize it? Um, well, I was, I was really excited to see. I just, I sort of like ran through the parts that I could play. Um, and it sounded nice, so I was excited. <laughs> and what about the parts you couldn't play? Um, I was a little scared, but <laughs> I learned it. So is this the kind of piece you're likely to put into your repertoire now that you know it? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good answer. All right. Just <laughs> fill in very quickly uh, where you're from and who you study with. Um, I'm from Silver Spring, Maryland. I study with Nancy Breath and Boris Lutsky. Ah, oh, Boris Lutsky studied with my mother, so we're in the same camp here. All right, you're going to play the piece for us, the promptus, if you will.
Well, thank you so much. It, uh, really, I was just saying to Lowell, it's a beautiful, really beautiful piece of music, and we have heard it now twice, and it has not lost any of its freshness and, and attractiveness in the second round. The third time it might. Well, we'll <laughs> see. We'll get a third one tomorrow, right? Because the judges will have selected one of these folks as the quote, best uh, performer of this particular work, your commissioned mm -hmm. piece. So we will get yet another opportunity to hear it tomorrow. I'm very curious if any of you have, and I'm looking again at this side for a change, if any of you have impressions about the forehand piece that you are going to be performing tomorrow and how you felt about forming a sort of, well, we were talking about writing at a deadline. You had a deadline to form a real close partnership. Any of you have thoughts on how it was and how it felt? Anybody over there? All right, I'm going to call up my dragon fella here because okay. um, what was it like to kind of make an instant friend, make an instant partner? Well, I mean, like, all of us want to get the pieces right. And I feel like um, the difficulty and also the most important thing for us, the two piano kind of thing is, um, I feel like uh, being really one of the um, very hard thing to do um, on one piano with four hands is to show pulse, to have the same, um, the, the, the same feeling of rhythm. Uh, we're playing Mozart and two gazebo dances. And feeling, feeling it really like a dance instead of metronomic beats, mm -hmm. it's very important to put together. And that's limited because we have limited space on the piano, on the keyboard. Physically, you can't really show that to someone. And also, like, as, um, as mentioned before, we only have like one person uh, pe pedaling. So gestures, you're limited. And getting the same kind of feeling and uh, agreement on the beats and on the rhythm, on the, you know, it's, I, I feel like that's very important and it's very hard to achieve, especially in this deadline. Well, of course, yeah. that's, that's the most difficult part, I would imagine, mm -hmm. forming that, that uh, understanding with your partner. Yeah. Um, had you played much forehand music before you came to New York? Uh, not much forehand, but I've done two piano Mozarts. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've, my old teacher back in Colorado, he arranged a, um, a few of the Russian composers and they, they put together a chopstick variation. Oh yeah. <laughs> and um, that was really fun to play, but it's very like bottom oriented. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so um, no, not much. All right, well, we will look forward tomorrow, as we've said, to the uh, day, mostly most of the day given over tomorrow to the forehand performances. There will also be master classes by various members of the faculty here and the judges. And then comes the Grand Awards concert, and that's at 7 o'clock tomorrow. All of these are open to the public. There are tickets available for the 7 o'clock. Everything else is on the house here. And uh, most of all, I am greatly indebted to Lowell Lieberman, not only for having written these great pieces, but for giving us so much insight into the life of a composer and, and the way the music evolved. So thank you well, very thank much. Well, thank very you. Much. Um, yep. May I just say one thing? <clears throat> Tomorrow night at the awards ceremony, we will be giving out prizes and um, finalist awards. But the philosophy of the New York International Piano Competition, and I want, I will say it again tomorrow, but I'm saying it tonight to all of our outstanding contestants, that in our eyes, you are all winners. So you must feel that you are here because you were outstanding when you sent your DVDs in. And uh, at the awards program, naturally, we all want to be 
uh, winners. I won't be looking at any of you tomorrow to think that you, if I looked at you, I'm the first prize winner or the second prize winner. But you're all winners tomorrow Well, you night. guys don't even know yourself. Who's no. Who? We won't know until 15 minutes before. They don't let you in on what's going on here. No, they, they don't send the message down until 15 minutes before. <laughs> no, actually, as you know, it's all done computerized by a man, uh, Dr. McBain, who uh, does it for many of the leading competitions throughout the world. And he's busy. He's going to be busy tonight and tomorrow. And he'll call us probably uh, 30 minutes before we go on stage. Hmm. And even, so the suspense continues. Even the jury <laughs> does not know until 6.30 tomorrow night. Even the jury itself. That's correct. correct. We will be feeding him numbers tomorrow morning, and uh, we'll get the answer, as Norman said, late in the afternoon. Very good, very good. So what will the awards, what will the award ceremony be, other than awarding the prizes, but there'll be performances well, we, also, yes? Yes, the first prize winner and the second prize winner will be asked to play a work, and I'll be telling you this tomorrow, I told you before, but. You should pick a workout that's about seven or eight minutes, first prize, second prize. The first prize uh, of the ensemble will be playing, and also the first prize, uh, the prize for the best performance of the low Lieberman work. And that's going to be very difficult to uh, judge. Well, I would imagine that the, at the level we've heard just today. And after the awards are given out, we get poor again. <laughs> and we start raising money for two new years. <laughs> yes, sir, yes, sir. But meanwhile, the results are almost at hand. Tomorrow, the last day of the eighth New York International Piano Competition. What a thrill it has been to meet uh, all of these gifted young pianists. I'll hear more of you tomorrow, I dare say. And of course, to spend this time with Lowell, which has been a joy in itself. So thank you very much, all. <clears throat>